And it is my great pleasure to introduce Mark Hedges, Editor-in-Chief of Country Life, to you. Um, he has held that post for 17 years. And before that, he oversaw and edited more than 50 specialist magazines, which maybe explains why he's actually made Country Life into one of the most successful magazine titles in the UK. I mean, considering especially that every other week we hear about a new magazine, a magazine going defunct. Um, Besides me being a very big personal fan of country life, believe it or not, because I'm married to somebody who's literally collected three decades of magazines. And to research this session, I actually delved into literally, I would say like 80 or 100 of, the, of, of copies of the magazine. Um, among his editorial triumphs, I also wanted, I, I, want, I brought one, of, one example which is a magazine that was guest edited by Princess Anne. But he has followed, he followed, he also has had King Charles and Queen Camilla guest edit three other editions of the magazine. Now, um, compared to the last session, which was super intense and gave you plenty of political food for thought, Mark and I are gonna take a load off and um, enjoy ourselves and talk about country lifestyle. So to begin, Mark, Tell me about your own personal background. I mean, did you grow up in the country? Are you a transplant like me to the country? Tell us a little bit about your about how you came to, to love the country so much. Uh, I kind of grew up as like Stig in the dump. Um, I, I never really left the countryside. Um, um, I sort of grew up in an environment which you never know when you're growing up because you think it's kind of the normal thing. But um, my mother, my mother knew the names of all the wildflowers. Uh, we had sheep, we had chickens, um, uh, and I thought that was kind of very normal. Um, and where, so, where was this? Uh, this was a uh, this was uh, just outside Chipping Norton. I mean, shows how much the Cotswolds have changed because um, my parents bought this house for I think it's twenty two thousand pounds. The current owner is uh, uh, Clarkson's one of his wives, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's sort of like the Cotswolds had gone back in then. All you had to be able to do was uh, ride a pony, ride a horse. Um, now you have to, you know, really worry about your makeup or whatever when you go out. Um, the Cotswolds has changed hugely. Um, so I grew up there. It was all pretty idyllic. Um, and I, I, just, uh, I just absorbed countryside things without realizing I was doing it. I mean, my, you know, my favorite book was uh, Lord of the Rings, which actually is about, in many ways, a sort of English utopia. And there's lots of sort of stuff in there. And I think that's why I liked it. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a very easy, slightly, you know, idyllic uh, childhood. And um, I then sort of, I went, uh, I went to university. Uh, the strange thing for me is editing Country Life, which uh, is quite a literary magazine. I did uh, double, maths, double maths, physics and chemistry for A level, um, which I think goes to show that uh, any of you have children, um, that uh, the path that they may be set out on isn't necessarily the path that they should follow. I did geology at Durham. And then I rang my dad and said, because back in those days, there was a thing called the milk round. They come round with uh, white wine of dubious origin and say, you really need to come and become an accountant or you need to become a lawyer or whatever. I rang up my dad and said, um, dad, it sounds really boring. Um, I want to go to Newmarket and work with racehorses. And so um, uh, that was kind of how my first journey. But again, it was kind of not particularly living in London, um, and it's trying to be outside. So do you actually commute or do you work? What, what is country life actually after the pandemic? Where is country life based these days? Well, I mean, technically it's based uh, in a grubby office. Um, we, we, always think, we always sort of pretend that we, our offices are sort of like in a Georgian house outside Sarancester. But the fact is, um, <laughs> it, it's in a pretty grubby office um, just outside Paddington Station. Um, and we, 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 um, we had the pandemic was, it was kind of crazy when it arrived, like it was for everyone, you know, suddenly we have a magazine country life comes out every week on a Wednesday and it's quite a challenge suddenly from everyone on their kitchen tables to 
keep it going, but we did. And then uh, at the end of that, I think slightly to my regret, the company said, well, you obviously can do that, so can you continue doing that? So we, we go into the office every Tuesday. I go to London a bit more because you sort of have to, oh, I have to. Um, but, you yeah, know, we, we more or less do it uh, from home. Um, and, you know, there's people, people living in the north of Scotland, people living uh, in Devon, people living uh, all over Britain um, who are my editorial team. And in a way, I think that's good because um, I, think, I think the English countryside is the most fascinating, most interesting in the world. And there's kind of reasons for that as well. But I think... Um, what just not having everyone you know how do, how can you really edit a magazine about the countryside if you uh living and working in london every that's day? why i was asking yeah. and and actually um on that note you alluded to the idea that the english countryside is not just the most fascinating but when we first met you actually you actually said it was the most important in the world so i wanted you to um elaborate on that idea because it's quite a quite a statement Okay, you know, I may, may have been showing off at that point, but um, child them house. It, it is, it is, it is the. Uh, I think it is the most remarkable countryside in the world. And actually, funny enough, um, although all my science stuff hasn't really counted for much, um, having done geology at Durham, you get to uh, understand that Britain has really, truly the most astonishing geology in the world because it is um, a little island. Uh, separated from Europe, separated a bit more actually recently, but it's a little island. Um, and in geological terms, it has been pushed and crunched and shoved. Um, you know, where the Solway Firth was, there was once a, an ocean wider than the Atlantic, just to give you a sense of how much it's changed. And what, is, what that actually means for everyone here is that the countryside changes very, very rapidly. So I, I drove from Hampshire um, this morning to come up here. And it, in, in 20 miles, you know, I left a place where all the houses in the village were made out of flint. And when you get here, you, this charming little village, and, you know, there's all these, I presume they're Elizabethan houses made out of uh, the, the, black, the black oak and um, because... I suspect that a lot of the land around here is clay. And then, you know, so you go to the West Country, the houses are made out of uh, granite. And you go to Yorkshire, they're made out of yellow, yellow, um, uh, the grit. And what's really interesting is that, so our country is tiny. It's really tiny. But if you drive for 100 miles across the middle of America, nothing changes. You drive for 100 miles across Britain, you will see so many different types of environment. And what's interesting about it is it's not just that the house is made out of flint, where I come from. It's just that the whole of the topography, because that's obviously chalk. So the whole of the topography is different. So we live in, in the downs. And, you know, historically, there was a particular breed of sheep, the Hampshire down that lived there. There's a particular flora that lives there. There's a particular fauna that lives there. And that applies to every single one of these different environments across Britain. And so the local distinctiveness of Britain is why I think it has the most interesting and important countryside in the world. It's also important because culturally, we take the countryside and have taken the countryside more as part of what I would describe as being the DNA of being British or English. Um, so soon after I became editor, sort of 16, 17 years ago or so, I was asked to go to the Japanese em embassy to meet the ambassador there. And um, there's a lot of bowing. But after we had met, he basically had one single question for me, which was, uh, we have a problem in Japan that nobody wants to live in the Japanese countryside. Japan's very like Britain is an island, is a seafaring nation by by history, but everyone wants to live in uh, Tokyo or Osaka or wherever. And it was sort of a rather astonishing moment for me because I had just grown up thinking that everyone wanted to live in the countryside, and 
it seems to me that most people do want to live in the countryside. We ran a survey in Country Life some years ago. So, uh, but 18% um, of the population live in what has turned the countryside, but actually 68% wanted to live in the countryside. Now, what's odd about that is that this just doesn't happen in other countries. Um, if you live in the countryside in France, you're regarded as a peasant. And the only people who seem to want to live in the countryside in France are the English. <laughs> and, and so, and when you sort of start thinking about other countries, the, the lure is always to the, the great cities. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. Is I think um, culturally, if you think about the great writers of uh, great novelists, if, you know, if you talk about the Bronte sisters, you know you're in Yorkshire. If you talk about Hardy, you know where you are. De Maurier, you know you're in the West Country. Austin, who lives near, near my, where I live at the moment, you know where you are. Shakespeare, you know, probably the, well, the greatest writer in the English language. All his plays and sonnets are full of the most extraordinary, accurate natural observations. Um, if you then think, so our culture without, you know, we don't have our truly, with the possible exception of Dickens, we don't have that much great writing about city life. We have our best writing about the countryside. And I think then you add in, to, uh, there's other ingredients to this. Um, I think it's important to recognise that Britain goes through the Industrial Revolution before any other nation. Um, and after that, something called, with sort of Gilpin and Ruskin, the picturesque movement comes in. And there is a sort of rejection of some of the satanic mills type things. I mean, Jerusalem is a tribute to the countryside. Um, and we, we, you know, the, if you look at some of the posters in the First and Second World War to trying to get people to join up, there's sort of pictures of hop farms in Kent or whatever. Many people have never seen them, but they somehow knew from their this DNA, I can't really think of a better way of describing it, that the countryside mattered because you were British or English. I think it was important as well, um, probably more for the upper classes, but... Um, when you have uh, when you have Victoria and Albert buying Balmoral and again celebrating that outdoor type of life, and then obviously they um, rather nearer here they buy Sandringham. Although I think they bought Sandringham mainly to keep Edward VII away from his mistresses, but it, they were still fundamentally um, a celebration of country living. Um, the emperor in Japan doesn't leave Tokyo. The royal family in Britain, whenever they can, goes and spends it in the countryside. And I think you know, the royal family may or may not be as influential as they were there. In fact, they're not. Um, but the, the, it was an important influence um, of this is a good thing to be doing. Uh, so we are just natural country lovers. Country life... Um, uh, somehow is the most successful magazine uh, in Britain, if not the world, on the basis that for the last 16 years, each and every year, its sales have gone up. But that's part of the, probably the main reason for that, is that the interest in the countryside, uh, which I think the politicians lag massively behind, but the interest in the countryside has grown enormously. So there's a programme on um, BBC One, I don't particularly like it, but called Country Fire, Country File is watched some weeks by more people than watch EastEnders. The, Nat the National Trust, uh, which is the biggest membership organisation in Europe, is, if I can say it, next to such a lovely place. But most people are members to walk their dogs. Um, and, and they want to walk them in a beautiful setting in the countryside. So actually, the countryside is r really rather hot at the moment. Um, you throw in um, the pandemic, disaster. But actually what happens is everyone wants to move to the countryside. And uh, provided the Doris in the village shop could work out what a latte was, everyone was happy. Now, um, now Mark, actually also 
Thank you, Mark, also because he's literally answered every single question that I had planned for the first, <laughs> for the first 20 minutes. Um, I wanted to ask you about, yeah. do you think that the, so, the, so you think that basically there, there are more people interested in moving to, do, do statistics and facts show that people are actually continuing to uh, relocate to the countryside in the wake of the pandemic, or was that just a blip? I mean, comparing it to the depopulation in the Japanese countryside, for example, I mean, what is the direction of demographics in the UK in the countryside? Um, Certainly, there was uh, an unprecedented surge during the um, pandemic. Um, the easiest way to judge that is that uh, the house prices in the in the countryside have obviously we've had a lot of interest rates go up recently have remained much more stable than they have in the in the cities, big cities, which. Is is simply a demand that they um, people still want to go there. I think it, you know. I think it's also important to acknowledge. You know, I might be some sort of messiah for telling you that the countryside is great. Not everyone likes it either, and some people have come there and found that actually Doris couldn't make a latte, and they've had to go back. Actually, one of the um, big issues during the pandemic was second home ownership, yeah. and you wrote an op-ed piece for the was it for the Times? Yeah about that. So tell us your thoughts about that. I mean, this is related to the question, what are some of the threats being faced by the country, countryside right now? Well, I think the, um, the biggest challenge that the countryside faces, um, the British countryside is almost completely man-made. There's a little bits of Caledonian pine forests in far off bits of Scotland, but everything else has been created by man for various forms, primarily of farming. And I think it's a really important thing to hold that, that in your mind, because things that we think beautiful, say like the Peak District, that has the geology of the Peak District, but on top of it, the stone walls and the little fields are all done by man. And so the greatest threat to the countryside is really uh, the is the state of farming, in my mind. Um, farming is, a, I, I believe you've heard this story um, in last year, but you know, farming is the most extraordinary industry um, in Britain in that if you own something, it's always for sale. You know, if you started up a company um, making cheese, ultimately it could be bought. But in farming, that just isn't really the game, the job is to ha hand it on to your son or daughter. And what has happened now, and it's, you know, it's incredibly well documented, is that the average age of a farmer is the mid 60s, which in itself isn't necessarily a problem, but the next generation do not want to take over. And so I think that that, that is a challenge because it does mean that the farm may well uh, either be sold or if it's a tenant farm, it'll go back to uh, the bigger estate. And that means that inevitably we're going to get bigger farms. There's nothing wrong with big farms. I think you had a very good talk this morning where uh, it was demonstrated that big farms can work well. Um, uh, so it's not, a, it's not against big farms, but it's losing to some extent their sort of local distinctive uh, type of ways that they farm, and what I think, what I think is slightly forgotten in the debate that's happening at the moment about um, around elms. So you basically get money from the government if you do good things to the soil or you do good things to um, butterflies. That's great, but we all need some food as well. And I think you know if if we go too far. It's in the sort of rewilding side, and our food prices go up by another 30% because we have to bring more in from abroad. That's not right. I mean, our food security, when I was young, Britain could feed itself. I mean, it might not have been that exciting food, but we could have fed ourselves. Now we have the capability of, um, we, we could technically reproduce 100% of all the food that the nation needed. Now it's down to about 45%. 
And I think we just got to be really careful and really thoughtful about how we find a balance. Everything about the countryside is about a balance. Um, it's, and where the balances get upset, you get problems. So I, I, I take an animal that many people uh, love, um, the badger. The badger is, uh, you know, it's in literature, it's a beautiful animal. Um, it's, it was protected because it was appallingly set to fight terriers and other dogs. Quite correct, it got protected. The badger numbers have absolutely exploded in, uh, no, I don't think you have so many in uh, East Anglia, but in the rest of the country, West Country. They... <laughs> okay, you do, but you didn't used to. Um, and um, when, when, I, when I was uh, 13, there were 50 million hedgehogs in Britain. If you ever saw roadkill, it was a hedgehog. When was the last time any of you saw a dead hedgehog on the road? How many, but how many of you have seen a dead badger on the road? And it's interesting because badgers eat hedgehogs. And that is where a balance has got out of hand. Um, and I, and it, you could take that example for many, many different subjects. And I think, so I think the challenge for the countryside, to answer your question in the most long-winded way possible, is that um, it's about managing a balance rather than uh, deciding this is the new thing. I mean, one of the things I think is terrible about DEFRA is arguably that the environment um, is the most important subject facing our time. It's the job that every minister doesn't want to have. So it's, it's the least important ministerial position you can get. And you tend to get ministers, uh, you know, they t come in and, you know, they desperately want to get out. They may, may be there for two years or three years, but um, in recent elections, probably less. And so how does anyone get a grip of it? How does anyone have a view? There is no collective view about how the countryside should operate. Will, will country life, look, thankfully, with agromines, for example, yeah. that uh, the column, which is, how would you say, it, it used to be called the crusader? Yeah, countryside crusader. Yeah, and now it's like a little bit, I, I took away that sub, that sub moniker. Yeah. Because it was clearly an, had, a, had a, an agenda of activism. I mean, so do you feel that um, political, like mainstream political culture is too focused on urban areas in general? This is something that we had alluded to and that um, maybe because of the great importance of the countryside and the existential question of ELMS and DEFRA, should we be focused more? Do we need more shows like Clarkson's Farm? Do we need more mainstream, like mainstream magazines like Country Life? What, what, what would you like to see happen? Well, I, I mean, the problem, you know, the simple problem is that, um, in my view anyway, um, politics has become ever more short term. And the reason it's become more and more short term is that everyone's actually just trying to get elected. Um, and for the reason that if only 18% of people live in the countryside, uh, you, if you're a political party, you might as well uh, concentrate on the 82% to try and win the election. So there aren't enough votes in the countryside. Um, that's not going to change. Um, what I do think is that I do think that, that government is running five years to a decade behind the, uh, the energy and the belief about how important the countryside is. Um, and I can only hope that they start to realise that, you know, when Countryfile is watched by more people than EastEnders, that the countryside is important. Um, but, you know, I don't know how much, how many of you have ever sort of spent a lot of time in, in that sort of Westminster bubble. The truth is that they're really not worrying about the countryside very much at all. Um, you know, the, the, it's not part of their thinking. And, you know, traditionally, almost all the countryside uh, seats end up going with big conservative majorities, even the, you know, the Conservative Party. Uh, used to be in the early 70s was regarded as the party of the farmers. Um, 
I don't think the Conservative Party is really any better than any other party in terms of caring about the countryside or anything else. Now, moving to the um, just to, to the magazine and country living, because, you know, presiding over this this publication for a while, how has country living changed during the past 20 years? That's a gigantic question. So I would say both in terms of the cultural mindset towards it, what have you seen? And then also just like daily living. What are the biggest changes that you see? Well, it's country life, not country living. But um, I know. Sorry, <laughs> I meant that as a generic <laughs> phrase. Apologies. Um, it was interesting. So I, I became editor in 2006, and I took over from um, a much cleverer chap than me called Clive Aslett. And um, the magazine was, uh, it hadn't been doing particularly well in terms of the sales, but it was uh, a lot of much longer articles than any of you who see it now. Um, but the biggest difference uh, that I thought and my first real change was that we started all having these dreaded mobile phones and everyone, I mean, whoever knew that you needed a camera on a phone, but we, we got them and people started taking pictures and everyone is now enormously more picture literate than they've ever been before. You know, before the phones, you know, we'd take the, take the roll out of our camera and, you know, if Auntie Maeve's head was off, well, that wasn't too bad. But, you know, nowadays you t you take another one and, and Maeve's head's on. And um, so the challenge was that, uh, and also people's reading habits were changed. People actually, um, I'm sure this room's not a prime example, but people can't read a lot. Um, they don't, you know, it, Country Life still does 2,000, 3,000 word, word articles, but you can't do that all the time. And I kind of edit it thinking of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, that it means sort of, it needs to be da 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 da. So you kind of got to give them a little bit and then a longer bit and a little bit and a longer bit. And you have to break it up with really, truly sensational pictures or the best that you can, you can get. Um, the magazine, when I took over, it was, uh, it relied on the the people buying the magazine. It was all in those days. It was all bought in shops. Subscription didn't really exist, and the sort of world famous property advertising that it has at the beginning, and um, that was great. But the uh, I quite early in my time that we had the Lehman's crash, and property became nobody wanted to buy property for a bit. And I, so I thought, well, look, we need to slightly change. So we, we've done some other things. The most important thing in the magazine, uh, there's three things that really matter in the magazine. It's the countryside, the gardens, and the architecture. And as long as that remains as good and as strong as we can do it, we've actually, I think if it's a washing line, we've sort of hung a bit more interior design off it and a, uh, some bit more luxury. Um, but... But we, you know, it's, it's a different magazine to what it was. It's an interesting magazine that has to appeal um, from the property point of view to all age groups or um, the, the business model, dreadful phrase, but the business model kind of is that you've got people maybe 75, 80 downsizing, selling their £4 million house. And then I need to have readers who are 40 year old who want to upsize. And so you need to, it's, it's a very unusual magazine. Most magazines have a very, very uh, narrow age width. Um, and Country Life is quite different. Tell, tell, us, tell us, describe the reader profile. I know it can't be averaged, but if you could just give us some of their core attributes. Um, I think, well, I don't know if I, I'm going to tell you something different, sorry. But, because uh, I don't know is the truth. <laughs> I, um, I think what what's uh, you know all I can tell you is uh, the magazine's been incredibly incredibly unusually successful. What I think they they're interested people. I think uh, I think country life is kind of a little bit like an open university. So hopefully you learn something every That's week. Right, so you're it. inquisitive. Um, it tries to be as accurate as it can be. So it I mean we make mistakes, but not so many of them. Um, it's also a lucky dip in that um, nobody quite knows 
including myself, where the editor's mind has gone to choose that story or that feature to go in. So, and I take the view that if you, you know, if you're really not interested in that article that we've done on holly blue butterflies, the next one will be on uh, how your how your delphiniums can be four feet taller or something like that. And so, you, I, you know, I'm always a bit, I get quite worried when somebody says I read every word because I think, well, you must be really strange because, <laughs> um, because I don't think it, it, it's meant, it's not meant to be, it's meant to be a magazine that is very, you know, as eclectic as possible with some very, very strong, a strong skeleton of those, the three giants of gardens architecture and, and the countryside and you know country life was founded in 1897 um, by a man called um, Edward Hudson and the first person who was doing the architecture was his protege who was Edwin Lutchins who um, basically through the the promotion by um, the owner of the magazine became the greatest celebrated arts and crafts architect um, across the world, you know, obviously the cenotaphs built from him down where I live in Surrey and Hampshire, lots of houses are built by him. So's most of New Delhi, so's a lot of Washington, um, and so it, you know, that they and they also, whilst he was writing, Gertrude Jekyll, the famous gardening lady, chubby lady, she was um, she was doing the garden. So right from the beginning, they were getting the very top people of their day. Um, and you know, the, I don't think we've ever matched the the quality of uh, expertise that we had at the at the uh, early days of the arts and crafts movement. Now, how did, has how how have the changes in the magazine reflected the changes in the countryside and country living country living <laughs> in the past twenty or thirty years? What what do you see the most, both culturally and in terms of how? We actually live our lives, like mechanically, transportation. It could be anything. The biggest changes that you I think seen. the biggest changes is that um, the the countryside, for more people than ever before, is not just somewhere else. It's some. It's somewhere that they uh, they may have always aspired to, but it's you know it's on television more. Um, I think. You know, the, the biggest pastime in Britain isn't going to watch football matches, it's going for walks in the countryside. That wasn't always the case. Um, the countryside offers so much for nothing that's free. Um, you know, if we, if we left the beautiful gardens here, we could walk down a lane and it would be full of wild roses and cow parsley and uh, corn cockle and whatever. Um, so a lot more people are are interested in it. I think there's a lot of people who, you know, it's, it can be scary. Um, I think, I think the job, the job that I've tried to do in the magazine is that there's so much assumed knowledge. So, um, the, they would have assumed 20 years ago that everyone knew the difference between a stoat and a weasel. We will actually tell the readers that the stoat's slightly bigger and has a black spot on the end of its tail. And so what I've tried to do without, you know, upsetting the people who do know that is to make sure that the door can open to let more people join in. Um, because the, the best way of saving the countryside is for more people to be interested in it. Actually, what is the readership? I mean, a lot of them are actually, a lot of your readers are based in, in, in a city or based in London or yeah. have a big presence there. You, what are the statistics Well, I mean, 30% of the, so we come out on a Wednesday, so it gets mailed to where you are on a Wednesday. And 30% of them are people who live uh, in London. Um, so it is a big number. I mean, uh, um, I was quite happy to dodge the uh, second home question, but uh, walking into my own nightmare. Um, the the uh, I think the you know a lot of them have a second home in the countryside. Okay. Um, now, what are your own favorite pursuits? This is like on a on a personal note in the okay. countryside. Um, how do you spend your time? What are your I I, I uh, sort of have spent my life as the kind of original hunting, shooting, fishing man of a sort of kind of late 19th century to some degrees in that uh, when I was a horse and hound I was the hunting editor I then became the editor of Shooting Times and now at Country Life 
Uh, the only thing I actually really do is fish um, and garden. Um, uh, so I, and I, I live my life, by, I always think of sort of like, a, it's a bit like um, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I sort of take something up and by the time I've walked through the wardrobe, I've done it. So, you know, there was a time where I would argue anyone tonight that hunting was the best thing. Um, I've pretty much given up shooting because uh, I've done enough of it. Um, and now I'd argue, I'd arm wrestle any of you, that fishing is the most wonderful thing. Although gardening is really creeping me up quite fast, quite dangerously at the moment. So um, I, I'm sort of, I'm a man of, of short-lived passions. Okay, so your life exemplifies an issue oh, no, I, of country life pretty much. I think that's like. the thing that's um, the easiest thing for me is that I just really, really love it. And, um, it shows through. I mean, if yeah. you can reach someone like me who could have been landed from Mars. <laughs> I mean, it is one of the b most um, I impressive bastions of independent journalism and writing, too. I think it's a, a real the, precious the, the rarity. The good thing about the magazine is that we get loads of ads and, and it's, you know, happily incredibly profitable. Um, but um, we... Many magazines write stuff to, for the advertisers rather than for the readers. And I have always taken the view is that you have to have a reader before you have an advertiser, and it's not the other way around. And there's lots and lots and lots of very famous magazines that have gone bust because they started pandering to the advertisers rather than looking to the readers. And in the end, you know, Country Life is, is, is read by you know, people like you, um, and um, I, you know, we 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 get some amazing advertisers. Um, you know, Dior has just started advertising. We don't really do. We don't. We don't write about. You know, we do do some luxury, but they wanted to be there because they wanted. They like the environment of the magazine rather than the fact that we were going to fall over ourselves to tell them the reason why everyone should buy a five thousand pound handbag. Thank God we don't do that. Um, so, so you know, it's it's an environmental thing, and what's what I think is sort of you know thank someone is that actually it's it's lasted better. It's that you know it probably has been the most successful magazine in the world over the last fifteen sixteen years or so. Um, it's because it hasn't sold out. Um, that's not to say I don't get tremendous pressure from the company that owns um, Country Life, but. Fortunately, I've been around a long time. I'm quite regarded as a bit of a sort of dinosaur, um, and uh, they they like the money it makes, and they kind of let me get on with it. Fortunately, well, that's an incredible fact and sounds, but it rings very true. On that note, I'd like to invite the questions from the audience, please. This lady. What about second homes? <laughs> oh, by the way, I want to ask, we didn't yeah. ask everybody, I mean, who reads Country, li Country Life regularly? Okay, of course, I expected a majority. Um, second Homes, yeah, no, I think it's a really, it, I find it very difficult, Second Homes. I don't think there's, I do not believe that you can deny anyone the right to have a second home. They pay, uh, they pay their money. Um, but I was born in Cornwall, and as somebody once told me, that Cornwall is it's like it's like a painting. It has a beautiful frame and a dreadful picture in the middle of it. And the problem is that the bit, the frame bit of it, the coast, is ridiculously expensive and impossible for any. You know, Cornwall is one of the poorest places in Europe, let alone the UK. Um, is absolutely impossible for um, for people to who who are locals to live there. I think there is a great responsibility uh, on second home owners, and I think many times they don't do this to uh, be more part of the fabric of the place and not just turn up for two weeks at the beginning of July and two weeks in August and then rent, rent it out to other people. None of that matters if you are part of it. 
But too often, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're big four by four blocks of road, or they, uh, you know, the, the Simon Jenkins, who used to read at the Times, he, you know, he, he wrote in the magazine about a sort of kind of, there ought to be a code for second, second homeowners. Um, it's kind of sad that we have to think there has to be a code. Um, it's even sadder because I know they won't uh, uh, probably abide by the suggestions. But I do think it, I don't really have an answer, if I'm being honest. Um, so I should have said no. <laughs> no, the main problem is that the locals can't afford to live in their current homes. Exactly. That's a really big problem. Um, but, you know, many of my, my children can't afford to live in London. Um, you know, it's sort of, uh, the world's not always, I don't say it's not fair, that sounds like I'm, I, I think it's a really intangible problem. Uh, probably somewhere I think they've introduced some sort of extra tax or something like that on second homes. Um, uh, the trouble with that is that normally the money then ends up in the wrong place. But I think there is, there, there ought to be some, some, Recompense. I mean, obviously, they provide uh, in the summer, you know, if I'm talking about Cornwall again, they provide a huge amount of um, employment and wealth, but then, you know, there's not so many people down there in January. Okay. Go ahead. So just following on from that, um, and I'm, a, you know, as, as a great lover of the countryside too, don't, don't we need more houses built? Yes. Because in Cornwall, there just aren't enough houses, social housing, for the people that can be afforded. And, you know, we've got to make decisions about the look of the countryside in order that more people can afford to have houses. I, I could not agree with you more. I mean, you know, every government talks about building lots more houses. The current government uh, has talked about, I think there are about 750,000 houses behind and what they promised. Um, you know, society has changed. Uh, the family unit isn't what it once was when I was growing up. Um, and we need more houses. We also have about half a million empty uh, flats and things above shops. Um, and one of the things that uh, I think is a problem is that there's, you, can, you could go and build on a greenfield site. And I do think some greenfield sites, and you know, I might edit Country Life, but there are some greenfield sites that have to be considered to be built on. But it's cheaper to build on a greenfield site than it is to repair an existing building. And that somehow seems to be wrong. Um, and, you know, there's half a million empty, empty one bed sit type rooms or whatever above these things because there isn't enough, it's, it's not enough money or there is no incentive to bring them back into use. That seems a dreadful waste to me. Okay, next question. The gentleman in the back, please. Thank you. Um, given that most of the children in this country are um, urban dwellers, how do you get across to them, given that they will be the policy influencers in 20, 25 years' time, how do you get across to them the, the realities of the countryside as opposed to the myths? I, in, in other words, about just actually eat hedgehogs. Um, I think you raise an incredibly good question. Um, I think at one stage... Uh, in the school curriculum, there was a sort of class that was called a nature class or whatever. That doesn't exist, I think, almost anywhere now. Um, we did a survey where I think 30% of um, children under the age of six thought that their eggs came from pigs. Um, so there is, a, there is a really serious problem with that. Um, the, the only way I can see it changing is with the school curriculum. But, you know, that's almost another subject for another day because it seems to me that children are taught to pass exams rather than be educated. Um, so, so, I, you know, if the parents aren't interested... I mean, there's obviously some wonderful things going on, but, we, you know, we're talking about millions of people, not the maybe the odd tens of thousands who get taken out... Um, from Tower Hamlets to see the countryside or whatever. Um, I think it's the challenge, you know, it, it, it's possibly the great challenge for the future of the countryside. Um, I think the countryside people are not as active as they might be because they, uh, for the reasons we were discussing earlier, I think, you know, politically it's not seen to be uh, particularly 
uh, you know, we're not like France where because of the Napoleonic Code, everyone owns a bit of land, and so they, you know, they're very good at sort of burning bales and things like that. The countryside is not uh, is not easily represented. I think the countryside organisations are mostly in conflict with each other. Um, so I do think, I do, you know, I, that's the bit I really worry about. And I, you know, thank you for raising that. Okay, I want to end on a light note. So I'm going to ask this question on behalf of my husband. <laughs> who helped me review the 80 editions of Country Life. Yeah. How do you choose the young lady you feature in the frontispiece photo? And he wants to know if you've considered men. <laughs> okay. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Oh, God. <laughs> I said Chatham House. Um, I, it's, it's been... Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's the most anachronistic page in publishing. It's also the most famous page within any magazine. Um, and uh, I just think it is wonderful fun. Um, it, it's, you know, the girls, um, they're not models. Um, they wear their own clothes. Um, we do sometimes send somebody to do their hair, but that's... That's kind. No, so Mark, I didn't ask because of oh. gender equality. Yeah. I was thinking that maybe you could feature my husband. <laughs> there he is. Back. He, he's not going to stand up and take a bow. Um, but thank you for answering. We, we, what we said that all I can say is that the very first frontispiece ever was a very hirsute Earl of Suffolk. So we might be coming back <laughs> into the right place. That's a great answer. <laughs> okay, on that note, thank you so much, Mark. That's that was fantastic. <laughs>